how current technological developments are, alter the balance of society, security, and beyond. So thank you so much, Delakis. Thank you so much, Georgia. I'm so honored to be invited to this, and I'm delighted that you're organizing this. I also want to thank Unicre, European Union, and everybody else who's made this possible. We just heard about what our organization, the Future Life Institute, is perhaps best known for so far, this uh, $7 million research program that we've just launched. But uh, before delving into details about that, let me take a step back and say a few words about technology in general. Our organization consists of uh, a lot of thinkers who love technology, but who, um, as Cindy Smith very, very uh, eloquently put it here earlier, feel that technology is something that both can empower and do fantastic good in the world, and at the same time gives us new power to screw up <laughs> in even grander ways than before. So we feel we want to do everything we can now to make sure that technology gets used for good. If we look at not very powerful technological inventions, like fire, for instance, we use a strategy of learning from mistakes. We screwed up a bunch of times and then we invented the fire extinguisher. But with more powerful technologies, nuclear weapons, synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, etc., we don't want to learn from mistakes. We want to get things right the first time because that might be the only time that we have, right? And uh, the way I think about this is to create a, a great future for humanity we want to win this race, this race between the growing power of technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage the technology by investing more in this wisdom. We're going to hear more in this session from Pierre and Daniel and Nick about <coughs> nuclear and bio and, and AI. But let me start by talking just a little bit about nuclear weapons because even though I want to end up with talking about AI, I feel that while we celebrate our successes here in the National Action Plans and, and CBRN, it's a very important at the same time highlight our failures so far to learn from them when we take on new, more powerful technologies so we don't repeat past mistakes. And I think that nuclear weapons is a great case study of, of inac inadequate risk management. Why do I say inadequate? since we still haven't had a global nuclear war. Well, let me just ask you this question. Which one of these two people is more famous? <laughs> and let me ask you a follow-up question. Which one of these two people should we thank for us all being alive here today because you single-handedly stopped the Soviet nuclear attack during the Cuban Missile Crisis? I'll give you just one hint. He wasn't Canadian, right? <laughs> so that already says something about how little attention we as a species pay sometimes to, to really important issues. And Moreover, I would say the lesson that we should draw from this is that, that you know, relying on luck is a really poor long-term strategy. The issue with Vasily Arkhipov was just one out of a hair-raisingly long string of near misses with global thermonuclear war. And although we've mostly focused so far about nuclear threats from terrorism and crime, we must remember that there have been also a lot of close calls where we almost had an all-out nuclear war between superpowers. And even if the chance is as low as 2% per year that that happens by mistake, uh, you know, the probability that we're going to screw up then within centuries is virtually 100%. So we need to do better than just hope for luck in the long term. If you play Russian roulette long enough, we all know how it ends. Uh, the second lesson I think we can learn from, from the nuclear case study here is that it's really important to understand risks in advance before you fully build out the technology. And I feel that we epically failed with nuclear weapons here. I feel personally guilty uh, about this because I'm a physics professor. <laughs> I feel this was our fault, partly as physicists. So let's look at the, quickly at the facts. When nuclear weapons were first built, the, 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 the decision makers and scientists generally thought that the worst, the, the main risk was that you would literally get blown up by it. And people had these risk assessments that if things went really, really bad, maybe we would kill 300 million people or something like that. Now we know that that's hopelessly naive and that this is not even, that getting blown up by it isn't even the number one largest risk to worry about. For example, oops, now this is a photo from downtown Las Vegas in the 60s. You see the mushroom-shaped cloud in the background? 
that's how close it was to downtown because people had totally underestimated the dangers of radioactive fallout. And acknowledging that now the US government has paid out more than $2 billion in damages to settle these downwinder cases, and there have been more people who were killed by fallout from these peacetime nuclear tests than who died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. But that's also not the number one risk, even though it was a big oopsie. In the 60s, it was realized that if you set up one single hydrogen bomb 400 kilometers up above Earth's surface, you can create an electric magnetic pulse of tens of thousands of volts across pretty much the whole continent, potentially this permanently dis disabling electronics, cars, cell phones, the power grid, uh, which can lead not only to catastrophic infrastructure meltdown, but also if you have a long power failure together with all these with thousands of, of, um, of nuclear devastated cities, then there are additional oopsies people hadn't thought about. For example, if you, if you actually have a long lasting power failure in a nuclear power plant, you know what happened in Fukushima? Well, if, if you don't keep the pumps on that circulate the, cool, the, the water that covers these spent fuel rods in pools like this one, it boils off within a matter of weeks. Then the zirconium cladding on the fuel rods catches fire, and then you get a super Chernobyl, and you, you could get that basically all of these fuel pools. There are 300 of them here, as I only draw, draw, drew little wind plumes around F, F, five of them, but you can imagine if you do that around all of them, it's, it's just further adding to the misery. I'm highlighting this at the meta level, just because these are things that people hadn't thought about for decades and decades while, the technology, while we built tens of thousands of these weapons. And, yet, and we still haven't talked about even the worst risk that's been discovered so far. Right now, if we, if we were to actually use a, a large fraction of the 16,000 nuclear weapons that currently exist, many of which are on hair trigger alert, so we could have, if you think of the largest couple of thousand cities on Earth, you could have them all destroyed within an hour of right now. Uh, if we were if to, to do that, then our nice looking planet here would before too long look, you know, maybe potentially like this, as, as the soot from the firestorms rose high up into the atmosphere in a shrouded earth. And, and this was not realized how, how serious this would be until the 80s, you know, about four, four decades after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And although this had a very powerful influence, this research and pers helped persuade Gorbachev and Reagan to negotiate the largest nuclear cuts ever done, uh, it turned out that, unfortunately, these calculations were, were rather inaccurate. They were made on a supercomputer, which was less powerful than this phone, and it turned out that they were too optimistic. The more modern calculations done by some of the world leading climate modelers on real today's supercomputers show that this might last not two years, but more like 10 years. And for the following summer, you can see here the temperature drops. This makes global climate change seem like peanuts in comparison. You see in the, in the American breadbasket, Ohio, for example, the temperatures are dropping by 20 degrees or so. That's Celsius, so 40 Fahrenheit for, for my American friends. And if you look in, in, so in Russia, China, you get drops of like 30, 35 Celsius. What does that mean in plain English? Well, we don't have to be agriculture experts to realize that if this turns into this, when you're going to harvest, it's not so awesome for food supply. And <coughs> One doesn't have to make fancy calculations to realize that rather than maybe having a few hundred million people killed, and as in some of the worst case scenarios that people had in the 60s, it's very plausible that the vast majority of all people on Earth would starve to death and then succumb to pandemics and other things that would have followed. No, not great. And, and the, the thing to take away from all of this, I think, is, is simply that this is an example of where we built the technology first and realized a bunch what the main risks were way, way later. And, as we get more and more powerful tech, we want to learn from this mistake and really understand the threats first so that we can avoid them in the first place. So in that optimistic spirit, let's uh, take a closer look here at the artificial intelligence. This is a technology which has wonderful potential, of course, to do great things. And uh, we've all seen how it's been making a lot of progress. The, the earlier the early progress in AI tended to be involved, like when Garry Kasparov lost at IBM's Deep Blue, for example, good old-fashioned AI where some human programmers taught the machine to do something that it could then do way faster than Kasparov and beat him. Um, similar 
sort of old-fashioned approaches that are very successful now are self-driving cars and to some extent when, when uh, the Jeopardy Deep Blue was, this quiz show was won by IBM's Deep Blue. However, most of the most recent breakthroughs that have happened and there's been a real, real ser amazing series of breakthroughs just in the last five years where things that people thought would take decades to accomplish have now happened all of a sudden. Most of that stuff has involved a completely different approach where the machine actually learns like a child. It's, it can take vast amounts of data and using, using deep learning and other techniques that Nick Bostrom will tell you about can actually learn to do all sorts of things that the programmer has no idea even how it did it. Just like your children learn to speak your language and you don't even know exactly how they did it. So look at this picture for example. This is something that was science fiction five years ago that was done last year at Google. You just send in the pixels of this image and the computer says that's a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. You send in this picture and the computer says, oh, that's a herd of elephants walking across a dry grass field. And we don't really know exactly how the computer did it because it just learned you know, from massive amounts of data. We'll hear more again from Nick about a little bit of the, under the hood of what's involved in this stuff. But I just want to talk about um, quickly two um, issues that this raises. So first of all, there is the, uh, there's a, so there are two completely separate issues we should not conflate. There are near-term issues with technology that pr almost exists right now, and then there are longer-term things about if machines get smarter than us one day, what might happen then. Nick will tell you plenty about the latter. But in the very near term, let's talk about AI weapons a little bit. So our organization recently launched an, an open letter on autonomous weapons, where, which was signed by over 20,000 people and, and about 3,000 of the world's leading robotics and AI researchers. And this open letter was very much inspired by the chemical weapons convention that we heard about from Dita Tsiganikova and the biological weapons convention that we heard about from David Fix. Why did these people these researchers signed this. Well, people who go into biology generally want to make the world better. They don't go into it because they want to make bioweapons. People who go into chemistry, they want to make the world better, not to create chem weapons. And it's the same, of course, with these AI researchers. They want to use AI to cure diseases, to help alleviate poverty and do great things, not to figure out new ways of mass murdering people or destabilizing the world. And they feel concerned that their, te their technology that they're building is being bastardized for really destabilizing uh, uses. What are some of these things that these people worry about? Well, uh, we, for example, today when, when drones are used to kill people, it's always a human who makes the decision, who's remote controlling the drone from somewhere. Right? But th within years, we, we, we'll have the technology that we can completely eliminate the human from this. Just have the drone fly around for a few hours, find somebody, ha use its own AI software, just like that elephant recognizing things, saying, oh, this is the person who looks like it's our enemy, and then have it, have it killed with no human in the loop. Uh, a big risk with these things is that if once any superpower goes ahead and mass produces this thing, of course, all other superpowers are going to want to do so too, and we'll have an arms race on our hands. But this arms race, these researchers feel, will be very, very different from the nuclear arms race. Uh, because Whereas it's very expensive to build nuclear weapons and very hard to get hold of the materials, these weapons will be incredibly cheap. You don't need any hard to obtain materials. A quadcopter costs a few hundred bucks on Amazon.com today. Uh, software costs nothing once it's developed. And <clears throat> you can have the potential that, that someone with an axe to grind for you know, under $1,000. Know, let me back up. If superpowers build this, if you get the arms race going, before long, North Korea is going to decide to build it and, and so on and so forth. And before long, some country in the need of cash is going to sell this on the black market. And then, and then all sorts of, of non-governmental organizations with an extra grind will have them. And these are perfect weapons for, for example, assassination. You can program in the, what your nemesis looks like, have a thing fly for two hours, identify the person, kill him, and then self-destruct so no one knows who did it. It's great for ethnic cleansing. You can program these things to look for a certain ethnic group only and kill them. They're, they're very, very cheap. Uh, you can imagine uh, swarms of little bumblebee-sized things which just 
recognize a face, find the eyeball, which is the sort of softest part of the skull, fires a little bullet there, which is very cheap and you don't need a lot of power, kills people. If you have thousands of those, you know, it, 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 it would completely transform warfare in a way that's very hard for, for nations to defend against other than by creating a police state. And for this reason, uh, there's a very quite broad consensus among the researchers in this field that this is an arms race we just shouldn't start. That's the best way to stop it. And I want to just conclude by pointing forward a little bit towards uh, Nick Bostrom, who's going to follow me here, looking at superintelligence. Sometime in the future, <clears throat> maybe in 40 years, maybe in hundreds of years, maybe never, we'll see. There's certainly the possibility that we might make machines that can do everything that we humans can do. And then what? Well, we, our organization organized the first ever conference of AI researchers to talk not about how to make things smarter, but to talk about this issue in particular, how we can win this race and have wisdom per, keep pace with the technology. It was in Puerto Rico in January of this year, and it was actually really productive. There was a very strong consensus that emerged that this is something we need to think about. The goal of artificial intelligence should be redefined from having the goal of just creating pure, undirected intelligence towards creating beneficial intelligence. And there was a very long, we brainstormed up a, a very detailed action plan, a list of research projects that should be done that would tackle embarrassing unanswered questions that we need to answer. And we need to, it might take decades to answer them, so we should start researching now, you know, not the night before a bunch of guys on Red Bull, you know, switch on their thing. And what was very exciting about this was that Elon Musk was present at the conference and he said, look, I hear you guys, you want to do this research? Well, let me give you 10 million reasons to do it. And with his donation, we were able to launch a worldwide competition for our research ideas. We were overwhelmed by getting 300 teams from around the world putting in wonderful proposals. And uh, it was very painful for the experts who had to review this to, to pick out winners. But 37 teams have now been selected and have started to work on this. And um, it is, uh, <clears throat> I think, going to be very, very exciting to keep following how this develops. We view this as just a little bit of seed funding for the wisdom. And I would encourage all of you with the resources of governments and big organizations to remember that if we want to win the race between the power of technology and the wisdom with which we manage it, we have to be mindful of the fact that almost all the investments right now just go into making the technology more powerful. There's almost no investment on the wisdom side. So if, if you're involved with any organization that could help a little bit ramp up this sort of research, you would do humanity a wonderful service. Thank you. Uh, Max, uh, thank you very much for this absolutely inspiring and wonderful presentation. We are now at Uniquely trying to invest in the wisdom side, certainly, and uh, <laughs> want to have you join us in this endeavor as well, uh, intellectually as well as in any other means. Uh, and the, your presentation certainly proves how important it is to bring these issues to the discussions at the United Nations, at the General Assembly, and at the, at the level of decision makers to have the awareness raised there and to see what we can do together to put all the stakeholders and all the particles together. Now, uh, uh, Max, you made a comment about the, about the drones and how easy it, it is to get them. Recently, there was an incident at the Japanese Prime Minister's house when somebody flown a drone with a radioactive material on top of it and got, uh, got there. Obviously, this was remotely controlled uh, uh, drone, but uh, but at the same time, what happens when machines get smarter? And this is something I'm going to address it to Nick Postrom. And I will introduce uh, him. He's a professor at the Faculty of Philosophy at the Oxford University. He's the uh, founder of, uh, found, uh, founding director of the Future of Humanity Institute, the author of the New York Times bestseller, Superintelligence, the book. And uh, he was named one of the foreign policy magazine's top 100 global thinkers. Nick, please tell us what happens when machines get, smart, get smarter. Um, first of all, I want to thank, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and, and everybody who's uh, contributing to making this meeting happen. Um, so just while uh, we're getting the PowerPoint slide up, um, I, I can say something in general about So I want to sort of expand on some of the things that Max were saying in his talk. Um, and, and this um, grandiosely named uh, research center that that are on the Future of Humanity Institute, we, we see ourselves as in the business of, of, of 
trying to put a little acceleration uh, on in, into the wisdom side of this race between wisdom and technological capability. Um, so um, to start with, I, I want to introduce a, a concept that that we find is useful for organizing our thinking. When, when you're really zooming out and looking at the human condition um, from a high altitude and look at the really big picture, this concept um, of what I call an existential risk. Um, there's never been an existential catastrophe in all of human history, uh, and there will only ever have been either zero or one. So an existential risk is one that imperils the survival of earth originating intelligent life that could permanently destroy our future. So all the things that have gone wrong in human history, all the wars and earthquakes and plagues, um, from, from this strange perspective, or sort of like mere ripples on the great pond of humanity, when, when you tote up the total amount of suffering and happiness uh, at the end of time, these might not really register, whereas an existential risk would be important in that context. Um, so we define it as a risk that threatens the premature extinction of earth originating intelligent life, or the permanent and drastic destruction of its potential for desirable future development. So this focuses our attention. Um, we have this very wide mandate, the future of humanity is to do that could be anything pretty much, but um, when you put on the lenses of focusing on existential risk, like almost all the concerns that preoccupy the world's population fall away because there just aren't plausible existential risks in there. And a very small number of concerns remain. Um, which we can divide broadly into two categories. So risks arising from nature and risks arising in some way from human activity. Um, one early finding of this field of existential risk studies is that all the really big existential risks, certainly if we're talking about the time scale of 100 years or 200 years, are in this anthropogenic category. Um, you can see this quite easily if you just reflect on the fact that the human species has been around for a long time, we have survived earthquakes and firestorms and plagues and asteroid impacts for 100,000 years. So it's just not very likely that any of those things will do us in within the next century. Um, whereas we will, uh, in this century, introduce entirely new phenomena and new factors into the world. So if there are going to be existential risks in this century, they're most likely to come from these new things that we will do. And, and, and most of the possible ones there have to do with anticipated future technologies. Um, and another way to look at this is, is to consider this metaphor of a, of a giant urn full of balls. Um, and, and you can sort of see human history as the process of reaching into this urn and extracting one ball after another. These balls represent ideas, technological discoveries, the products of human creativity. And um, throughout our tenure here on this planet, we have extracted a great number of these balls. And um, most of them have been good. Some of them have been mixed blessings. Um, none has been such that it has spelled our disaster. We might wonder, what would it be like if, if there were one of these black balls in the urn? Is there some possible discovery, some technology that could be invented such that it invariably spells the doom of the civilization that discovers it? Um, you could run a kind of counterfactual thought experiment and, and think back um, 100 years ago or 80 years ago before nuclear weapons had been invented. And, and you can ask yourself, what would have happened if it had turned out that instead of requiring highly enriched uranium or plutonium, like really difficult processes to, to unleash the power of the atom, what if there had been some simple way? Um, something like baking sand in your microwave oven or something like that, right? So, so now we know that you can't have a, a nuclear weapon by baking sand in your microwave oven, but before we did the relevant physics, how could we have known how it would turn out? Like it could have turned out like that. And, in that scenario, that might well have been the end of human civilization at that point, because if anybody, uh, just by doing some simple thing that they can do in their kitchen, could wield the destructive power to kill millions, then it might just be impossible to have cities and concentrated population and so forth. Um, but um, nuclear energy turned out not to be a black ball, but maybe a gray ball instead. Um, so it looks like our strategy currently is to continue to pull balls out of this urn and just hope that there isn't a black ball in there, because if there is, we will eventually pull it out, and then that would be the end of it. Um, we have a lot more ability to invent things than to uninvent things. Right? Um, so, so this is a general reason also for thinking that the biggest existential risks over the course of a century might be from <coughs> possible future discoveries that we might make. Um, and I've put up a, a partial list here of, of some of the perhaps more likely candidates for areas where existential risks might emerge. Uh, there are several things to notice about this. There's also 
all of these um, technologies here have great potential for beneficial uses, um, which um, paradoxically is one of the factors that makes them go higher up on this list because it increases the likelihood that we will actually develop them. If, if there was some technology whose only use was to cause destruction of humanity, then maybe we would have a greater likelihood of steering clear of that. But if it's something that has wide beneficial impact for health and environment and economy, chances are we will eventually develop these. Um, another thing to notice about this is, is that um, at the bottom there, I've put in um, some unknowns. So if you think again back 100 years ago and uh, consider what the answer would have been if you at that time would have asked what are the biggest existential risks over the next couple of centuries, then none of the ones that we might now be tempted to put near the top of this list would have been mentioned. I mean, certainly not machine intelligence. They didn't even have computers. Um, synthetic biology wasn't a concept. Nanotechnology was not a concept. They might have worried some about totalitarian tendencies, but for the most part, um, what now seems to be the biggest risks are ones that have only in recent decades popped up on the radar, and there might yet be others that, that we haven't yet conceived of, um, which is one reason why we think there is potentially a high value in, in doing this kind of research, just in case we can find something else that we might be able to do something about. Um, so now let me transition to speak more specifically about possible concerns from the future of artificial intelligence. At the very most basic level, the, the the, the point is this, that intelligence is an extremely powerful thing. Um, it's what makes the difference between the human species and, and our, in many respects, very similar uh, relatives, so the great apes that, that, that share most of our biology and, and only in very recent evolutionary time has departed somewhat. And, and these small differences um, in our brains uh, have resulted in all these vast differences in in our ability now to shape the future of the planet. So it's, it's our small um, increases in intelligence that have enabled us to develop this modern technology and so forth. Um, and it therefore seems plausible, just, just even at first sight, that if, if there ever were a time when machines became uh, as much cleverer than we are, as we are than other animals, then that those machines could be a very powerful shaper of the future. Maybe they would be able to shape the future according to their preferences. Um, and then um, that this, therefore, seems to be a topic that is worth transferring out of the domain of Hollywood movies and science fiction and kind of entertainment and into the arena where academic researchers can begin to think about it um, as a topic wh where the goal is not to have fun and be entertaining, but where the goal is to develop like, increasingly accurate beliefs and proposals. Um, so. Max was already um, mentioning some of the uh, advancements that have been made, some milestones that have been crossed. If we look under the hood behind these applications, then we see a great number of um, developments in algorithmic techniques th that have occurred, and pretty much all of these uh, really only since, you know, in, in the living memory of a lot of people alive today. I mean, the computer is still quite young. And so if we think about how far we have come in these past 70 years, uh, yeah, it, it's makes one realize that within the lifetime of us or our children that we might come perhaps all the way. Um, in addition to these advances in uh, algorithmic design and architecture, there have always been um, developments in, in hardware. And, and if you look at particular domains, say chess computing, you find that roughly half of the improvements in performance have been due to computers getting faster and, and half due to better algorithms. And, and that, as a rule of thumb, seems to be true across the board, that both hardware and software are contributing roughly equally. Um, in recent years, as in maybe the recent two or three, four years, there have been a, a new sense of excitement in uh, the world of artificial intelligence, a sense of having come un, unstuck, that, that the field was kind of stagnating a little bit before, but now, particularly with developments in, in what's known as deep learning and some other techniques, there is a sense of renewed progress, a lot of exciting frontiers to explore. Um, also reflected in industry activity with some, some high profile acquisitions and the kind of war for talent among some of the large software companies of the world. Um, we find um, artificial intelligence already in wide application th throughout the economy. Um, I'm not gonna read off the whole list, but a lot of the um, in inventions that were originated in artificial intelligence research laboratories 
um, we no longer tend to think of as artificial intelligence. Once they actually work, they just become software. And this sometimes frustrates AI researchers that they don't kind of get credit for all the things that, that have been accomplished. But, but, but AI techniques are in widespread use already, and, and that, that list will continue to grow longer. If, if we look, for example, at a game AI, as one particular area where it's easy to compare human and machine performance, we find that machine intelligence already um, in, in, in many games perform as well as or better than human uh, beings. Um, I, I think that the next big game where, where computers will uh, exceed us will probably be the game Go, which is kind of the Asian equivalent to chess, a big board game, great complexity. Um, some challenges that, that remain um, uh, today is uh, better methods for transfer learning. This is um, the kind of uh, technology we need to be able to use insights that you learn from solving one problem and then apply them in a very different area. And this is still uh, something of a challenge that AI researchers are working on. Concept learning, more flexible reasoning with learned concepts as opposed to just sort of symbolic tokens that don't mean anything, long-range hierarchical planning, reading, um, and more complex system architectures. Like the, you might get a slightly different list depending on which AI researcher you ask, but, but these are certainly some of the major outstanding challenges that stand between where we are now and replicating the full um, functionality of the human mind, the learning ability and planning ability that makes the human mind so powerful. Um, so, Reflecting on these developments, um, I think, as Max said, that it's very important to, to make a clear uh, and emphatic distinction between the near term and long term. Uh, both of these contexts have serious legitimate challenges and opportunities to think about, but they're quite different. So in the near term, we have uh, issues such as um, autonomous weapons um, that Max mentioned. We have of course, uh, non-autonomous applications of these. So you could have, in many situations, perhaps the human making the final decision by pressing a button, but with a lot of AI assist, uh, image processing, etc. cetera. Uh, you have, in a very different direction, people thinking about the impact of automation on, on the labor market and, and whether um, the problems with chronic unemployment that one is beginning to see in some countries have something to do with, with that, or whether it, in fact, has to do with completely other things like offshoring of, of labor or the economic cycle. But as machines become more capable, this is likely to become a, a bigger issue. Um, surveillance and data mining, of course, um, cybersecurity, uh, self-driving cars have issues for regulators, like exactly what will the legal frameworks be for allowing these on the road, and, and a bunch of other things. And, and these issues are quite different from the issues that arise if we ask the question, what happens if AI actually succeeds? in its original mission, which has all along been not just to create um, domain-specific applications, little tools here and there, but actually to do all the things that the human mind can do. Um, and that's obviously farther off, but also the implications are, are much more profound. So um, we did a survey of some of the, um, the world's leading AI experts um, a couple of years ago, and one of the questions we asked was, um, by what year do you think that there is a 50% probability that human level machine intelligence will be achieved, which we define for the purposes of this survey as the ability to perform um, know, most jobs at least as well as a normal adult. So, so real, genuine human level machine intelligence. And as you can see, the median answer to that question was 2040 or 2050, depending on precisely which group of experts we asked. Um, and um, that um, estimate should be taken with, with a large um, amount of, 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 of salt in that it's based purely on the subjective impressions of people expert in the field, but there is really no science that enables us to predict with accuracy how long these kinds of developments will take. It could happen much sooner or it could take a lot longer. So think instead of a particular year, think of a probability distribution so smeared out over a wide range of possible arrival dates. Um, th there, there is a a, a different question also about timing, but which must be distinguished from the first. So, so far, I asked about this kind of first arrow there on the horizontal axis, time until takeoff, like how, how long bef between now and human level machine intelligence. There is a second question, if we ever do reach that level, how long between that point and until we have something that is radically super intelligent? Um, and um, 
you might be quite pessimistic or optimistic, depending on how you look at it, but you might think that it will take a long time before the field of artificial intelligence will actually reach human level. Maybe you think that these um, opinions about the practitioners are biased. Maybe they want to believe that their field is really important and it will succeed. Maybe you think it will take 100 years rather than 50 years or more. Um, you might nevertheless still think that if we ever do reach that level, that the transition to super intelligence will then happen quickly. And in fact, that is my view, that it will be uh, harder to get from here to human level than to get from human level to, to radical super intelligence. Um, and one way to think about it is, is this. And intuitively, we have this notion of, of uh, smart and dumb that, that maybe looks somewhat like this. We think at one end, we have like the village idiot, completely hopeless, bungles everything. And at the other end, you have sort of your favorite scientific guru, with Einstein or Edwitton or something. And these kind of define the extremes of, of, of human cognitive performance. Um, with regard to how difficult it will be for artificial intelligence to achieve a particular level of performance, However, I think that the picture will look more like this, that we start at the left of this diagram with zero capability um, when we invent computers, let's say, zero artificial intelligence. And then slowly over time, the AI train moves along this track. And after many, many decades of really hard work by a lot of researchers, perhaps eventually we reach mouse level artificial intelligence, something that maybe can navigate a cluttered environment about as well as a mouse can. And then after a lot more work, maybe we reach chimp level, and after a lot more work beyond that, uh, we reach village idiot level. Um, but I don't think that at that point the train will slow down. Uh, I think it will just swoosh past human will station. Um, the, the brain of the village idiot and the brain um, of Albert Einstein are almost exactly identical. Same size, same number of neurons, more or less, same biology. Uh, there's no particular reason to think that it would be a lot harder to, to match one than, than to match the others. Um, so, um, um, to, to wrap up, so what, what I have argued, and I recently wrote, wrote a book on this, is that we then will confront uh, this uh, control problem, which is the problem of assuming it could solve the intelligence problem, like how could you actually make machines intelligent, like how could you then ensure that these very intelligent machines will, will be safe and, and beneficial to humanity? And I argue that this raises unique challenges, um, techni technical challenges uh, and foundational challenges, um, that there are plausible scenarios in which super intelligent systems become very powerful um, for the reasons I alluded to earlier. Like intelligence is a general purpose thing. If you have enough intelligence, you can invent all the other technologies you don't already have. And, and also, as I described in the book, there are these superficially plausible ways of solving the control problem ideas that immediately spring to people's mind that on closer examination turn out to fail. And so there is this open, uh, currently unsolved problem <clears throat> of, of how to develop better control mechanisms that is more difficult because it will need to be solved before we actually have these fully intelligent systems. By that time, we already need to have the solution. So, um, so I'm very glad that um, people like Elon Musk are stepping into the breach here where there has been a complete funding vacuum until recently. And, and that some activity is beginning to happen. Um, and, and I recommend that, um, that, that, that we sort of accelerate this work of establishing a field of inquiry to do foundational and technical work on the control problem and, and recognize that as such a distinct, legitimate academic endeavor that some small number of the world's best brains should be working on, just as so many other things are being studied by academics. Um, that we should try to attract top mathematics and computer science talent into this new field. Um, that we should build strong research collaborations between the AI safety community and the AI development community, both in industry and academia, because ultimately the path to success is that whatever ideas for safety are developed also get implemented, and, and both of these need to learn from one another rather than take up antagonized positions. Um, that in long-range scenarios and planning, we should consider superintelligence as a possibly important factor in shaping humanity's long-term future. This does not commit one to thinking that this is just around the corner, or that we should hold our breath and be like, super excited about every single announcement in the media. But, but if you're really thinking long-term about humanity's future decades out, then I think this is a legitimate thing to take into account. And finally, um, that it is important to um, integrate into this research community and into society's thinking about the long-term future of artificial intelligence, that this is a a unique technology that should be developed um, only for the, for the common good of all of humanity. It's too big to just be thought of as something that will raise the profits of one firm a little bit or give one country a slight edge. This is really a concern for all of us. Everybody 
in the world, if this is developed, will share in the risks, whether they like it or not. Um, and it also seems fair that everybody should stand to, to gain uh, if, if things go well and, and have a slice in the upside. Thank you very much. Nick, thank you very much for this uh, absolutely great presentation. And, uh, and one of the recommendations, what I would also add there is to bring uh, these ideas to the policymakers, to the international organizations and private sector and create some sort of a platform where, where all of these segments, all of the stakeholders could work together uh, to ensure that, uh, yeah, what we're going to do if AI succeeds. And as your, we see in your presentation, basically we are leading or we are heading towards that, that AI is going to succeed and we have to be prepared about it. So